Uh, how do you get your leads really in front of the mix? I keep my individual channels always at minus 10 dBFS. You need to be able to trust your room. My girlfriend's dog goes berserk. What is the biggest mistake someone new to music production can make at the beginning? Hey guys, welcome to the Kane Audio vlog. It's Friday, it's time for another Ask Me Anything. Usual rules apply. Comment anything you want below this video and I'll get back to you in next week's video. Uh, before I look at last week's video, house admin, I don't think there's anything I need to mention this week. Not that I can think of. No. So yep, yeah, straight on with last week's video. Looking at the comments, uh, doesn't seem to be too many questions, I don't think. So let's see how we get on. Uh, at the top, Casey Music. Hey Dom, uh, was kind of busy last two weeks, so no questions from me, sorry for that. Uh, firstly, a bit delayed, uh, congrats on your EP, it's awesome. Can't wait to listen to more concept work in a bigger scale, i.e. album. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so my EP is out now on Mousetrap. Um, yeah, I've had loads of great feedback, actually. Um, even on YouTube, I think it's been mostly positive comments. There's probably been one or two that I've seen that have said it's boring or whatever, but that's fine. Um, yeah, I've not really seen anything negative, so it's been all good. Um, and I like the fact that people seem to be digging... Um, the uh, Downforce track, which is kind of a bit out there, really. Uh, question for you. Uh, how do you get your leads really in front of the mix? Uh, is there a certain thinking process you have when you like the sound of your lead, but it just isn't strong enough? Is there a certain way to saturate or distort the sound to get it exactly where you want to have it? Um, so, I think, I, 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 I think when it comes to leads, there are a couple of things to think about. First of all, which octave do you want to be in? How high pitched should your lead be? I quite often hear lead melodies that are good, but too high pitched. And the higher pitched you, you make your lead sound, I think the, the less energy it tends to have. If you listen to the leads in my tracks, they're generally probably a little bit lower than you'd normally expect a lead to be. Um, and I think that's probably, I don't think I've ever thought about that consciously. There's only, as you asked the question, that I've really thought about that. But yeah, a lot of my leads tend to be a bit lower in the frequency range than, than others. Um, so I think, and I think that tends to add power in terms of, I think it's a psychoacoustic thing. It's not a real thing. It's just we feel that the lower tones have more power. So I think that's something to bear in mind. The other thing is just in the mix. If if you like something, turn it up. <laughs> um, I, it's uh, yeah. I'm not sure it gets much more simple than that. Uh, to be honest. Um, yeah, I can't, I don't think there's anything specific that I do. And I think that's the important point I'm trying to make is I, I don't think there's anything specific to bring a, a lead out in a mix other than turning it up a bit, maybe adding a touch of reverb um, and being a bit tricky with the reverb, use the reverb in a send channel and use it low down in the mix. So it just adds a little bit of atmosphere. Um, and yeah, I suppose adding some saturation can do it. Um, I don't normally add saturation directly onto a lead. I might do it to a bus in the mix at the end, but even then we're talking, you know, one or two percent um, saturation, tiny amounts, probably not enough to, to make a huge difference. Um, yeah, I can't think of anything else that I do, to be honest. Uh, second question. Uh, oh, hang on. 
is there a certain way to saturate or distort the sound to get it exactly? Just be really careful. That's the only thing I, I can say about distortion of any kind, saturation, clipping, whatever it is. Be really, really subtle. Um, I know it always sounds great when you crank up the dials to sort of 50, 60, 70, 80%, but, but actually what you're doing there is you're actually losing energy, you're losing power because it's just distortion and just clipping that we're hearing. So you really, I would say, obviously it depends on what kind of drive and simulations and whatever you have, but really for me, sort of, you know, a 10% wet level on saturation and clipping is probably about the most I'll ever use on anything, um, unless it's a creative decision where I want a specific sound to be really distorted or whatever. Um, but yeah, so be subtle. That's the only advice I can give when it comes to saturation. It's so easy because when things sound nice, it's so easy to make them too loud and too much. Um, and I think that's always one of the tricks of any good production should leave the listener wanting more. And, you know, if something satisfies you, don't have too much of it. Uh, maybe that's a good rule for life. Uh, second question. Uh, I keep my individual channels always at minus 10 dBFS, uh, which should give me enough headroom. The master very often results at about minus 3 to minus 5. Thing is, I just have the feeling that aside from my drums, which are easily loud enough at minus 10, uh, bass and synths don't have the power to overwhelm them really. Uh, I have tried compression, saturation, etc. Nothing really helps except turning them up one or two dBs, uh, which I don't really like to be honest. Uh, did you face that problem at one point and do you have a solution? So there are times, I would say, where you need to ignore the levels on your screen switch your, your your monitor off um and you know turn your back to the monitor or whatever and, and listen because actually you know what if you're let's say your drums are at minus 10 db another important thing to remember here is are you bussing your drums and are you talking about the bus being at minus 10 or are you talking at individual kicks and snares and whatever on their own being at minus 10 because actually if you've got a kick and a snare let's say just a kick and a snare, that's all you've got in your drums, if they're both at minus 10, every other kick, your master is not going to be at, you know, every every kick one, your master channel will hit minus 10, because your kick hits minus 10, but when the kick and the snare hit together, your master is now going to be whatever, I don't know, minus 8, 7, 6 dB. So there'll be a huge discrepancy there. So when you're saying your drums, well, if you mean all your drums together, well, that, that's that's why your bass and lead or whatever doesn't sound as loud, because your bass and lead are just one or two instruments that are hitting minus 10. Your drums could be hi-hats, claps, snares, percussion, whatever, all of these things hitting minus 10. So there's a whole group of these things. So they're the things sending your master to say minus three dB. Whereas your kick and your bass are, are really not affecting it that much. So sometimes you need to think about that balance and, and not look at the levels because your bass line might be hitting minus 10 dB, but it might not feel like it. And sometimes you have to go with your feelings in these things as well. But one thing I will say on that is you also need to be careful that your you need to be sure that it's not your speakers or your interface or your room uh, that are maybe making things sound louder than they are. Uh, compare it to other people's music, other people's mixes, mixes that you know you can trust um, and see where they sit relative to each other because uh, yeah, your room can make a big, big difference. Um, I know full well in this room because this is only a temporary studio. Um, I know that there are big spikes in certain frequencies. I think it was 150 hertz was a, a a dip or a spike. I can't remember, but I've had to correct it and I've used the acoustic treatment and whatever and used software to correct and whatever. Um, <clears throat> which is why you'll probably notice that 
in a lot of my vlogs uh, the uh, microphones come out a bit boomy and my voice is a bit boomy um, partly because of my position in the room and blah 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 also I screwed up on some of the vlogs with the mic positioning where I had it in a corner and that was echoing but that's a whole different thing I don't know why I'm telling you that um, but yeah so you need to be able to trust your room and make sure that your room is good before you start going with your feelings so I so where I'm saying ignore the levels and go with your feelings do that but also check with the levels just in case your room isn't perfect uh, so yeah hopefully that helps uh, Rod Marconi Tony high five hi Dom uh, loving the new EP and especially Stoic track. Uh, my girlfriend's dog goes berserk when it kicks in after the intro. Uh, but anyway, I do have a question. What is the biggest mistake someone new to music production can make at the beginning? Um, oh, that's a good question. The biggest mistake. Uh, funnily enough, I was going to do a video on this separately of uh, listing a few of the the biggest mistakes you can make um which i probably will do soon actually but one of the things i was thinking about this the other day uh one of the things i will definitely be probably top of that list is buying too many vsts i think i think that is new producers biggest mistake is is gear envy uh we all suffer from it I still do. I've been in this industry 20 years or whatever it is, and I still get huge gear envy. And I look at other people's studios and I want it and I see what software they're using. And I think, oh, I want that. And, you know, they might have some new VST and I hear a sound that I'm like, I want that. Whereas actually the truth is most subtractive synths sound exactly the same. You can get the exact same sounds out of pretty much any subtractive synth any additive synth makes pretty much the same sounds any wavetable synth makes pretty much the same sounds any synth in general if we're really honest and really brutal and just stripping back to basics pretty much any synth can sound similar to pretty much any synth yes every single synth and vst and whatever has its quirks and some have a little bit more character than others and some have maybe a better user interface and a better menu and those things are important 100 percent, i agree those things are important however when you're a new producer and you're learning anyway i would say find out what some of the most popular synths are some of the most I guess industry standard synths, whether that be uh, Native Instruments Massive, that used to be in everyone's box. Uh, nowadays, X First Serum and Sonic Academy's Anna 2. Uh, Silent One, I guess people still use that. Um, that and Massive used to be the two big ones. Uh, FM8 from Native Instruments. Um, I can't think of any others off the top of my head. I think those are the, the, the current big ones. Um, I would say if you were a brand new producer and you had some money to spend on VSTs and you didn't know where to start, I would say FM8 and probably x Serum would be two very good starting points. FM8 because... Once you get into the nitty gritty of that, which I've never personally done, I've, I've done basics in FM8, but once you get behind the oscillators and start really rooting stuff, you can come up with some incredible sounds with FM synthesis. Um, and uh, X for Serum, I would say, is great for wavetable and subtractive synthesis and a bit of a mixture of everything. Um, and again, there are some great presets, and once you start delving behind them, it, it gets bigger and bigger. Uh, I would say get them and stick to them and make entire tracks with those things and deviate from presets. Learn what happens if I turn this dial, what happens if I turn that dial. You know, so many new producers out there sort of go, uh, oh, I like 
whatever I don't know some famous I like that Martin Garrix track what did he use for that lead and someone will go oh he had Silent One so everyone goes oh I'm gonna buy Silent One and sound like Martin Garrix and you know you move on to some other famous artist and go oh that uh, David Guetta track who what did that bass line and someone goes oh that was I don't know whatever and everyone jumps and buys that well that same bass line could have been done on pretty much any other synth. It was, you know, whoever, insert famous name here, making that track didn't go, oh, I'm going to use this synth because it's so uh, different to any other and it makes this kind of a bass line. Chances are they were flicking through presets and maybe tweaked a couple here and there. Might even be a preset. But the point is, is that most synths are capable of doing the same as most synths and I think that's probably the most important bit of advice I can give any new producer is don't suffer too much with that envy um, you know I released my first ever records uh, with no studio monitor speakers I had a terrible Windows XP PC was it even XP it might have been pre XP my first ever proper release might have been pre XP. Um, <clears throat> shit, that would have been Windows 95. No, it wouldn't have been Windows 95. Windows 2000 could have been 2000. Anyway, whatever the case, terrible version of Windows. Um, you know, I, I think there was probably two, maybe three synths at tops and you know, you'd, you'd record one sound and have to record it into audio and then play with that audio and, and then run it through samplers and trigger that. It was just, you know, the point being is that I had very little equipment and very little knowledge and I managed to get them, you know, obviously by today's standards, they'd sound terrible, but you compare any basic laptop of today to what I had when I started, they're worlds apart and, um, you know, people were making great music, even electronic music, in the 70s, you know. You look at people like Kraftwerk, they were groundbreaking, um, you know, because they were using what they could get their hands on, and that, I think, is, is the important bit. And, and the point I'm trying to make here is that you need to learn to use what you have. Um, you know, I think that's the important thing. Um, there are a lot of people out there who are just buying a multitude of VSTs and then they never really learn what the buttons do or what the dials do and how to tweak them. And, you know, if you ever want to start sounding unique and start having your own sounds or whatever it is, then you need to start learning to manipulate sounds, even if it's an existing preset, just to be able to manipulate it and to know, right, I've got this preset and I want it to do x y and z you need to be able to know how to do that in any given synth um, so owning three or three hundred synths isn't going to change that uh yeah that was a bit of a rant uh where did we get up to uh dream state 42 hi dom hi tony <laughs> high five uh thank you so much for your thorough answer to my Bitwig Ableton question. Uh, really interesting to hear your thoughts and thanks for the minus 10 dB track defaults. Also Stoic is a fantastic EP, amazing work. Thank you very much. Um, in regards to Stoic, uh, I love the raw sawtooth sound towards the middle slash end which leads me to my question. What kind of processing do you do and would you recommend uh, on very basic sounds for the lack of a better word, like sawtooth sound coming in. Uh, which sound is that? There's a fair bit of sawtooth in there. Uh, 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 let's have a look. <clears throat> you watch me get a uh, copyright strike on this video now. Stoic. Right, and you're saying towards the middle end. Oh, do you mean 
that lead. Right, well that, I'm guessing you mean, is the, the, the big chords part. Um, so that is my Moog Sub Thick 7. Um, is Sawtooth with some feedback looping saturation. Um, so it's, uh, it's it's clipping basically. Um, what processing do I do beyond the synth? I, I don't think I do anything. No, I don't think there's any reverb or delay or anything on that. There's no saturation. There's maybe a filter because I'll I'll record my filters manually by hand uh, using the Moog. Um, but I will always or nearly always drag and drop a digital filter on top of that. If it's say I'm doing a low pass filter sweep, uh, sometimes I didn't quite get it perfect by hand. So sometimes I'll sort of correct myself. Um, although I try and keep everything by hand because I prefer that more natural, uh, movement. Um, but other than that, uh, with a sawtooth, uh, so, I mean, it's difficult because I, I know what you're saying. You're, you're saying that a single sawtooth wave will sound cheap and plasticky, which it does. And you're right. I think that's what you're saying uh, when you said raw sawtooth uh, and basic sounds. Yeah, so a single sawtooth oscillator will always sound cheap and basic. Um, so it's always a good idea to double up with two oscillators having a sawtooth. And maybe if you've got a sweepable waveform, and this is the important bit with the Moog, for example, is you can sweep from sine wave through to triangle, saw, square, PWM, whatever. Um, and I will have the two oscillators on saw wave. One will be dialed slightly left of saw, and one will be dialed slightly right of saw. Um, so that they don't perfectly synchronize and that <clears throat> that adds a little bit of texture to them i'll usually also use the sub oscillator as well so if you're using something like uh x first serum then that's available to you um, but just very subtle in the back then i will usually pass the whole thing through some sort of maybe phase distortion or something um, but again very subtle not too much um, but I might stack up a couple of saturators uh, if you're wanting to add extra depth. Um, I would also take off some of the high end if I was you, especially if you're using digital sawtooth oscillators. They can sound very. There's a. There's a. There's almost. A, it's. It's too perfect. Is what it is. So I would usually maybe sort of cut off a bit of the, the highs, so stick a, a low pass filter on it, but just dial it down ever so slightly just to be subtle, not too much. Um, and then I guess, like I mentioned earlier on, pick the right octave. Be careful with the octave. If you notice those leads, they're actually almost in bass range. You know, they're, they're sort of quite low down in, in the range. Um, they're probably the highest they reach is probably an alto range um so i'm wary of that and in fact they i think the the two note chords are playing over two octaves so there's one quite low down um yeah so i think there's a whole bunch of things that you've got to be careful of like i said earlier on with you know choosing the right octave keep them low down because the higher you go especially with the sawtooth it's gonna sound cheap and tacky and that's not what anyone wants uh, yeah, hopefully that helps. Um, I would say play around with with Sawtooth. You know, um, if you can find a synth, I, I'm I'm almost a hundred percent sure that X First Serum has sweepable. Um, it must do because it's wavetable, and someone must have dropped in. Uh, I, I can't remember what waveforms there are, but there must be a sweepable sign to saw or. Uh, preferably one that covers sine, triangle, saw and square all in one sweepable movement. If that's the case, then, you know, move that wavetable up and down a few notches and just see if it sounds a little bit more crunchy and has a bit more depth and just play around with them. Um, 
so yeah, I think that kind of ties in. I think all of today's AMA has been focused around learning one synth and playing with that synth and seeing what it's capable of. Um, and yeah, so there we go. That's pretty cool. Uh, BWO official, Tony, high five. Hey, Dom, hey. Uh, Deadly Custard, Tony, high five. Fin Fighter, Tony, high five. Zombo, hey, Dom, how tall are you? Can't think of any question at the moment. Uh, I'm 5'11", I think. I'm one inch away from six foot, uh, which is 180 something centimetres. Hundred and eighty-two, so I'm less than hundred and eighty-two. Uh, hundred and eighty point three, hundred and eighty centimeters. There we go. Uh, so yeah, I'm trying to force myself to do everything in metric these days because in Britain, for some reason, uh, we mock America for never using the metric system. And yet in Britain, we're probably almost as bad. We still deal with miles per hour, miles per gallon. We weigh in stones. What the hell is stones? Um, and we still measure in feet. Anyway, uh, you've replied to your own comment. Have a question now. Analog versus digital mixers, like the one Deadmau5 got, the Neve 5088. Uh, well, that's not a question. First of all, that's a statement. Um, do you want my opinion on it? Uh, and I can see someone has replied to you, GG11, saying it's a mixing console, dickhead, like an SSL console, and it costs half a million, stupid piece of shit. Well, well done, GG11. You are the first twat to appear on this YouTube channel. So uh, you deserve an award of cunt of the century. Um, the Neve, uh, do you know what? I, look, obviously I'd love one. Um, we mentioned at the beginning of the video um, uh, that um, about gear envy and stuff like that, you know, clearly look, I'd love a Neve. Um, I don't think it would make my productions any better, if I'm honest. Um, I love the tactile, tangible interface of hardware in, in general. So clearly, if I had a studio the size of Deadmau5's and the budget of Deadmau5's, then clearly I would, I would absolutely go for something like a Neve. Um, and I have used a couple of Neves in a few different studios before. And they do definitely have a character, much like the real world version of what I've mentioned with um, Mixbus 32 and stuff like that in the past. So it's uh, it's definitely something I would love to have. Um, but in all honesty, if even if I did have them, I don't think my productions would be any different. They certainly wouldn't be any better um, or not distinguishably to normal human ears anyway. Um, I think it would just give me, the user, more satisfaction. Um, yeah, so there we go. And then final one, St. Nicholas, Tony, high five. Uh, that is it for this week's, and I can see I'm coming up to the 30 minute mark. Uh, if you've made it this far into the video, comment the word link to let me know you've made it this far in. Uh, thanks for everyone for listening and I'll see you again this time next week. Cheers.